Many churchy words grace our lips, but elude our understanding. If you've been around the church forever, or only visited once, there were probably words that left you scratching your head, maybe even feeling a little dumb. During this four-week series, with all our campuses combined at Waldemar Nature Center, we'll unpack four important churchy words. Faith, confession, gospel, and salvation. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Sycamore Creek and Church in a Barn at a Nature Center. All of July, we've been worshiping Waldemar. And I don't know about you, but I'm just so excited when I get to have all three campuses together. It's nice to see faces that I don't get to see as often as I'd like to. So uh, Mark introduced me. My name is Kathy Doby, and I, I'm a partner of Sycamore Creek. I attend a Potterville campus. Shout out Potterville. Any Potterville peeps? Okay. There's a few Potterville people here today, and I am on the vision team and the worship team and the teaching team, and I'm excited to be here today to share this message on churchy words. And in my regular day job, I'm a quality management systems manager. Doesn't that sound exciting? Quality management. It's exciting at 21st Century Plastics in Potterville. And we, we are a plastic injection molder of primarily seating and assemblies for Big auditorium stadiums, uh, U.S. Bank Stadium and, and uh, Minnesota, Vikings, um, all those little purple seats came through Potterville. So it is kind of exciting. And my job as quality manager is to handle issues, issues with quality, if there's problems, customer complaints, that sort of thing, which can happen from time to time. And uh, we have words to describe these unacceptable, uh, malformed plastic parts, words that may mean nothing at all to you, but they have a very specific uh, definition for plastic injection molding. And we train our employees on these words so that there's no confusion, there's no misunderstanding. Everybody's on the same page. We all know what they mean and understand. It's a common language we share with our coworkers. I bet you have them in your vocations too. We have words like flash and sinks and, and uh, shorts and splay and oozing. Now, I'm not going to take time to explain what all these things are to you, but I can tell you this much. Oozing is never good. <laughs> not in life or in plastics. We don't want any oozing. And so language is important. Language is very important because it affects how we think and behave and, and how we interact with other people. So we need to agree on the meaning of words. And uh, we don't want to have any miscommunication. So a lot of things have their own vocabulary, not just our workplaces, but our hobbies, the, the things that we participate in, sports. And our church has a lexicon as well. And that's what we've been talking about in this series, these churchy words that, uh, that we hear. And, it, and this is a, a series from Life Fellowship, New Life Fellowship Church in New York. Pastor Rich Velotis uh, led this message for them. And we're looking at words that you commonly hear at a church or by Christians, and you no doubt have heard them and even used them yourself, but you may not have been fully grasping the meaning of these words. And so that's what we're here to clarify. And we've already looked at faith and confession, and today we're talking about the word gospel. Gospel. I invite you to say that word out loud with me. Gospel. Gospel is important because, well, if we get the gospel wrong, we get everything wrong. So we want to be clear. And so we're going to have two questions today that we'll explore about this word gospel. First, what is the gospel? And second, why is it important? Easy peasy. Sounds like pretty easy questions. So the word gospel comes from the old English God, meaning good, and spell, meaning news or story, God, spell, gospel. The word can trip us up because we don't use it in any other capacity. Unlike the words, other words we've talked about, faith and confession, which we do use in our common everyday conversations, we don't use gospel really for anything but to describe the gospel. I mean, we never say to someone, well, I've got gospel. 
and I've got bad news. <laughs> Which do you want to hear first? We never do that. Maybe we should do that. I'm going to start doing that. My mom would sometimes use the phrase, the gospel truth. Yes, yes gospel. She did this when she wanted to convey that something was absolutely undeniable, irrefutably the, the truth, the gospel truth. And I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear that word gospel. Maybe you think about a favorite New Testament scripture, you know, the, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And maybe if you're like me, a little Sunday school song just popped into your head when you heard me say that. If you know it, join with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John heard the good news and they passed it on. Listen and learn, look and see. The gospel books for you and me. Good news, good news. The gospel means good news. I said good news, good news. The gospel means good news. You guys are just like the VBS group. You pick right up. I give you a little hand signal. So, <laughs> you didn't see that. Maybe you're a little more soulful than that. And maybe when you hear gospel, you think of gospel music and, and an image of Whoopi Goldberg comes to mind, you know, in a nun's habit from that, that hit movie, 1992, Sister Act. Remember that? She's belting out a chorus with the, with the uh, whole choir. I will follow him. I won't get into that one. But yeah, maybe you, that's what you think of when you hear gospel. But what does it mean to you? This is a good place for us to stop and have a, a little connection question. Most of you know the drill. You've been here and done it. It's a good time to turn to somebody close by and, and have a little conversation. It might be somebody you haven't met before with all three campuses here. So I would ask you, invite, uh, introduce yourself if you don't know them and ask them this question. What does gospel mean to you? We'll take about 90 seconds. Now that we've had a chance to kind of talk about what the gospel, what we think the gospel means, we're going to get to answering these two questions. Uh, what is the gospel is our first question. And we're going to look at this question from a biblical viewpoint, what does the Bible have to say about the gospel? And the Apostle Paul talks about the gospel of God in his letter to the Romans. And, and this is going to be the scriptural basis for this message, Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 1. We'll look at a couple of different verses, but this is Paul speaking to the Christian church in Rome, both Jews and Gentiles, which is a term that describes everyone who is not Jewish. And he's preparing to go to visit them there. So listen to, uh, to how many times Paul mentions the gospel. Chapter 1, starting at verse 1, Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the power, the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse nine, God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. From first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now this is where in a lot of liturgical churches, that is churches that follow a specific order of public worship, where the leader might say after the scriptures read, this is the word of God for the people of God, and the people's response is, yeah, you guys know it. But what happens a lot of times is what we just saw there. It comes out sort of like, Mr. Lawrence Sachs in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You remember him, right? Bueller, Bueller, this is the word of God or the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
it lacks a, a certain inspiration and maybe even credibility. So let's see if Sycamore Creek Church can respond to the word of God as if we truly are thankful, shall we? This is the word of God for the people of God. I think they heard you online on YouTube. That was good. Good job. This letter from Paul to the Roman church is a lot to take in, isn't it? I mean, it's the gospel of God. It's the gospel he promised in the Holy Scripture. It's the gospel of his son. It's in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's a lot. It's a lot of churchy words. I never realized how many churchy words there are until we got into the series. There's a lot of them. So righteousness, for example, it's a churchy word. So just to be very clear, and for the remainder of this message, whenever I use a churchy word, you will hear this sound, <laughs> followed by a simple explanation. Okay, got it? Churchy word, <laughs> explanation. I'm going to put it right on my belt so I don't forget it. And let's start with righteousness. Uh, it's living in right relationship with God and others and all of creation justly, honestly, and faithfully. That's righteousness. Paul unpacks the gospel in his letter to the Romans. In other translations of the Bible, replace that word. Mark already gave it away. The good news, right? Gospel. Good news. Good news. The gospel means good news. And that is what it is. Good. But what is the good news? That's what, we want. That's what we want to know. What is the good news? Paul explains it very well. It's the good news of the Son of God. Simply said, it's Jesus' story, the story of his life, death, and resurrection. And it's important that we understand this because life will put a little different spin on the gospel. It can, it can become distorted. And much like the plastic molded part the gospel can be malformed. From the Oxford Dictionary, we see malformed means misshapen. And isn't it interesting that it refers here to a person or a body, part of the body, as we talk about the gospel of God and the body of Christ. We need to be careful with these malformed gospels because they are misshapen and we are easily swayed. We are. There's four malformed gospels that I want to talk to you about as we discern this question, what is the gospel? Four malformed gospels that will help us to better understand what the gospel is and more importantly, what it is not. There's some semblance of truth to these, I will say that, but they are not the gospel truth, not according to Paul in his letter as he defines it scripturally. They're more what I would call feel-good gospels than they are good news gospels. So the first of the four malformed gospels I want to talk to you about is the go-to-heaven gospel. I mean, we all want to go to heaven one day, maybe not today, but one day we all want to go to heaven. So that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that idea. However, the gospel's not primarily about our eternal destination, as believers of Christ, we are already promised salvation, <laughs> rescue, deliverance from sin and death. The trouble with thinking the gospel is primarily about our going to heaven one day is that we might miss out on what is going on right now, right here around us, in this life, right here. This past Christmas, I gifted my father-in-law, Bob, uh, a daily devotional. It's been a tradition for me to do that now for the past several years, and uh, it's probably the gift I put the most time and energy and effort into because I want to make sure I get him just the right one. I spend hours browsing through the religious section at Barnes & Noble looking at all the devotionals because I want to make sure he, he gets the right one. And so I found a really good one this year, uh, this past Christmas. It was by Paul David Tripp called New Morning Mercies, and I knew Bob would like it, so I was feeling pretty pleased with myself. I gave it to him on Christmas Eve. But a few days later, I was a little confused. I came home, and I found that book on my front porch. Now, Bob usually gives me back the devotional I gave him the year before. So it didn't take me long to put two and two together. 
realized I'd given him the same devotion, <laughs> devotional. Two years in a row. Yeah, that was my feeling exactly. Ah, I couldn't believe it. I guess I must have really liked it. Uh, but what started out as sort of an embarrassment turned out to be a blessing in disguise because rather than return that book and get him a different one, we decided we'd go through it together. And that's what we've been doing every morning for the past 202 days now. We go through that devotional together and we text our reflections back and forth. And it's been a really uh, good practice for accountability. I strongly encourage you to do that with someone if you don't. Uh, but also a good bonding experience for Bob and I. As I was preparing for this message on the gospel, one of the daily readings in our book, several days in a row, in fact, talked about the gospel. Isn't it interesting how that happens when you're studying something and your devotion has it? So Tripp talked in this book about how people live with a great big gap right smack dab in the middle of their gospel. And this is what he wrote. Most Christians have a basic understanding of salvation past. That is the grace of forgiveness they have received because of the broken body and the shed blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And most Christians tend to look forward with anticipation towards salvation future. That is the grace of endless eternity, of complete peace and harmony lived in the presence of the triune God, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But sadly, many, many Christians have little understanding of salvation present. That is the benefits of the work of Jesus Christ right here, right now. It's vitally important that we understand the nowism of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand the nowism of the gospel and that Jesus' death on the cross is not just for the past, the already, and it's not just for the future when we get to heaven. It's for the right now. Jesus died for this day right here. He's smack dab in the middle of the already and the not yet. July 21st, 2024. The go-to gospel, the go-to-heaven gospel would have us resting on our laurels. But the gospel of God is available to us now. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to experience. The good news is for our everyday life. That's the first malformed gospel. The second malformed gospel is the freedom from rules gospel. People who embrace this gospel are more apt to say they're not into religion, but they are into relationships. They, they might tell you they're not really religious, but they are spiritual. I take that to mean they don't really want to conform to a lot of rules. They don't, they don't really want anyone telling them what to do. And that includes conforming to the doctrine, <laughs> beliefs of a church. I get it. I get it. The church has not always gotten it right. It has done some damage. I'm sure some of you could tell some stories of the harm uh, the church has done in your life or the life of somebody you knew, but don't worry, I'm not going to make that a chat question. Thank you. The freedom from rules gospel may alleviate uh, our responsibility, but God's commandments are not rules to constrain us. They're loving guidelines to help us live a healthier, happier, holy life, better than we could do otherwise on our own. I love this quote from St. Augustine. He said, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, it's yourself. Our lives need order. If we just do whatever feels good in the moment without concern about the consequences or how it might affect other people, we're not following God's will. We're following our own. Essentially, we're putting ourselves in God's place like the well-known bumper sticker says, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. Just don't do it while you're driving. Switch seats. The third malformed gospel is the stop, striving, and rest gospel. Now, this one sounds pretty appealing. Anything with the word rest in it gets my attention. But the trouble with this gospel is the excessive focus it puts on ourselves. Ourselves, our relationships, our personal desires, 
our own comfort. We can put so much importance on our own comfort that we forget that as a part of the family of God, the body of Christ, all parts are needed. We do have responsibility. There's only a few places in the Bible where we see the words my Lord or my God spoken. Mostly we see our God, our Lord, our Father who art in heaven. We're often cautioned not to overstrive to the point where we burn ourselves out. And that's good advice. It is important. But to stop striving and rest gospel places so much emphasis on our personal contentment that we may, be, we may be stopping altogether. We might stop striving to be the church altogether and stop using our unique gifts and talents that we've been given for the good of all. You know, your gifts aren't just for you. They're for you to use to bless other people. We should rest by all means. We should take a sabbatical, a period of paid leave. In the corporate world, we call that PTO, a little paid time off. And we should observe the Sabbath. Hey, you're here. You already know about that one. Keep it holy. But be mindful that we don't neglect to be the church in the process. The world sorely needs the church to be the church. I would say especially now, but I don't think that's true. I think that's always true in every generation. The world needs the church to be the church. We are Christ's representatives in the world, right? His hands, his feet, his heart, his mind. Christ is counting on us. The fourth malformed gospel is the improved society gospel. Again, sounds like a pretty good thing, right? But similar to the stop striving and rest gospel, this gospel puts an exaggerated amount of attention on improving the world, so much so that we are distracted from keeping our eyes on Jesus and making him the center of our worship. We must pay attention to the world, to injustice, to prejudice, to reach out to those who are marginalized in the world. As part of the body of Christ, it's an important part of Sycamore Creek and who we are. It's part of our DNA, right? We have groups within our church who are dedicated and working tirelessly to improve the world around us through structured programs like CORE, Congregations Organizing for Racial Equity, and participating in Pride to support the LGBTQ community. It's important work. We don't just say all are welcome. All are welcome. We demonstrate it through core values and being curious and creative and compassionate. How creative can you be to have church in a barn? It's important work, but the danger of the improved society gospel is that when the work is put in the forefront, it's easy to lose focus on Jesus. The church is never meant to be built on anything or anyone other than Jesus. If Jesus takes a back seat, the church is of no use to society because the ministry is only effective when Christ is the head of the church. Listen, nobody puts baby Jesus in the corner. Nobody. Thank you, Mary. Matthew 6.33 sums it up with this one sentence. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first God's righteousness. You know this one. It's living in right relationship with God and others and all of creation and everything else justly, honestly, and faithfully. And everything else will fall into place, will be taken care of. It can be a slippery slope, but it's a slope that goes both ways. It slides both ways because a church might also neglect to do those important work of justice and to speak for those who are defenseless and cannot speak for themselves. So we have, to, we have to have balance. Isn't that the key of everything in life? Balance, but put Jesus first. That's why it's Jesus and justice. We must make good use of the opportunities to do good, and we must keep Jesus in the center of it all. Did you notice how all four of these malformed gospels, these feel-good gospels, the focus is turned inward on ourselves. The good news, gospel of God is not about us. 
It's about Jesus. It's his story. Jesus is the good news. Every time Jesus shows up in the New Testament, it's good news for somebody, somebody who's hurting or in need or been mistreated. And Jesus is our good news today. Everything we need is found in the gospel of God. As I look at these four malformed gospels, I see evidence of all of them in the world around me. But the one that sticks out to me the most probably is that number four, the improved gospel, because it seems so often that Jesus is given sort of honorary mention anymore, if he's mentioned at all. And what we tend to glorify or celebrate are the accomplishments. We worship what is created rather than the creator. I want to give you another opportunity to chat with someone, maybe somebody different. Turn the other direction and mix it up a little bit. And we'll take a couple minutes to answer this uh, question. Which of these four malformed gospels stands out most to you? Is it the go to heaven, freedom from rules, stop striving and rest, or the improved society? Take about 90 seconds and talk about it. All right, we've answered the first question. What is the gospel? I think we have a pretty clear, clear idea now on what it is and what it is not. And as I heard somebody say, you know, there's other ones out there too. These are not a comprehensive list. There's other ways the gospel gets malformed. But uh, we're going to move on and look at the second question now. Why is the gospel important? That may seem like a no-brainer to some of you. But again, if we get the gospel wrong, we get everything wrong. So let's be clear. Let's break it down. Just as a quality management system needs to have an objective or a purpose, there's objectives to the gospel. And I want to talk to you about four key objectives of the gospel of God, which will help clarify the importance. Again, these may not be the only ones. These are four we're going to talk about today, but they are key. And the first objective of the gospel is that it provides true happiness. In fact, the gospel is the only way to find true happiness. You know, we all long for happiness. We, we, I don't care who you are, we all want to be happy. I don't think there's anybody here today thinking, boy, if I could just be a little more miserable, <laughs> then I'd be happy. No, everybody wants to be happy. Regardless of your current level of happiness, you want to be more happy or happier, the happiest you can be. However you define happiness, you want more of that, okay? And it's, it's a goal in life for most people. Be happy. It's what we wish for other people, too, our children, our grandchildren. Ask any parent, what do you want for your kids? I just want them to be happy, happy and healthy. Go to any bookstore. Browse through the section on happiness. It's overwhelming, the market it has on the books. The first question Jesus asked his disciples after his resurrection is, what do you want? What do you want? I think he wanted to know what would make them happy. What do you want? Well, if I just had fill in the blank, then I'd be happy. If I could just do this or be that or have that or find whatever, I'd be happy. Happiness based on this line of thinking is always just out of reach. It's like the money question. How much money do you need? Just a little more. Then I'd be happy. A little more than I have. I'm at the stage of my life and the age of my life where many people I know are looking at retirement. Either they've already retired or they're, they have a date on the calendar and count, counting down the days. And it's frustrating for me because people often assume I am retired or that I should be. And I get a lot of, you are not retired yet? Or, well, you're retired, right? Even my doctor, every visit I go to, he'll say, well, you're not still working, are you? Every time, with a tone of disbelief and judgment. Just this past week, I saw him. I said, what would you do before you retired? Ah, I'm still working. I, I, I know I must look like Methuselah's mother, <laughs> the oldest man in the Bible. Uh, because at least once a week, someone will ask, when are you going to retire? And I feel like I have to defend myself all the time and explain why I'm still working at my advanced elderly age. <laughs> Listen, retirement is approaching for me, not quite, not yet there, but there are days when I can fall into that trap of thinking, oh, once I retire, then I'll be happy, if only so I can tell people I'm retired and they won't ask me anymore. But if I'm not careful, 
I can find myself getting sucked into that mindset of feeling like, you know, almost sorry for myself, especially when I see friends and family posting hashtag retired life photos on their social media. Sort of like in the winter time, you know, when you're out there scraping the ice off your windshield in the 15 degree weather, sleet and ice, and so you go to work. And your sibling, who's in Florida, is on, on this Facebook page for the winter, for the winter, posting in the middle of the week, in the afternoon, pictures saying, blessed beyond, or life, whatever, living the dream. This cartoon perfectly captures it. Uh, this wife is hollering out to her husband, phone's for you. If it's my brother in Florida, I don't want to talk to him. Friends, we don't have to wait until fill in the blank to be happy. True happiness is available. The time to be happy is now, and the place to be happy is here. And the way to be happy is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only way to be truly happy. You know, it's a kind of happiness that doesn't rely on your circumstances. The gospel of God brings salvation, <laughs> rescue, or deliverance from sin and death. And that is something to be very happy about. It's also our second objective. The gospel of God breaks the power of sin and death. The cross of Christ is not simply a bridge to get us closer to God. It's crucial. It's a crucial part of it. But the cross is also a sledgehammer that tears down what separates us from God and from one another. In Romans chapter 3, Paul talks to the Romans more about God's faithfulness, that no one is righteous, not one of us is righteous, except by God's grace, <laughs> the free and unmerited favor of God. Paul said this, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption, being saved by grace, that came from Jesus Christ. The cross makes the difference. It tears down what separates us from God and from one another. The Reverend Billy Graham was a renowned spiritual leader for over 60 years. He counseled thousands, if not millions, of people during his lifetime, including many of our presidents, he did not, perhaps, always live into what he preached, especially in the early years of his ministry. Not one of us is righteous, not one. But his words inspired many, and in his later years, Graham was a pioneer of many of the justice movements we see today, and he said this about the gospel. The gospel shows people their wounds and bestows on them love. It shows them their bondage and supplies the hammer to knock away their chains. The gospel of God breaks the chains of sin and sets us free. A third objective of the gospel is that it creates a new family. This is your family right here this morning. Paul's letter was written to the Christian church in Rome to both Jews and Gentiles, <laughs> non-Jews, and it was scandalous in the first century, to, to lump Jews and non-Jews together. But Paul was telling them that the gospel of God is about a new humanity created in the name of Jesus. He's saying it's not just you and Jesus. And it's not just me and Jesus either. It's you and me and Jesus, all of us together. It's about relationship, the most important thing in life, relationship, the one we have with God, the one we have with others. Together we are the body of Christ, and we need all parts. Though we all come with our own individual perspectives, frames of reference, histories, backgrounds, upbringings, cultures, experiences, opinions, boy, do we have opinions, beliefs, values, cultures, even taste, taste in music, taste in food. We're different. We come with all this stuff, but the gospel unifies us in all of it. Our differences do not have to divide us. I want to repeat that because we need to hear it. Our differences do not need to divide us.
together we can work through the differences and embrace what we have in common, which is Christ. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, is credited for having said this. Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without a doubt, we may Herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. We need to laminate that one and put it on our refrigerators. The power of the most high God gives us the strength to be a new family, one big happy family. As Christians, we are obligated to show the rest of the world it can be done. The fourth key objective of the gospel of God is that it reveals God's faithfulness. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he wrote, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Righteousness. We know this one. You could probably say it with me. It's living in right relationship with God and others and all creation. Justly, honestly, faithfully, righteousness. It's a good word, but it's a churchy word, and it's not always looked on with a favorable light. We think of someone who is self-righteous, and it sounds a little stiff and judgmental. But that's not Paul's intention here. He's talking about God's righteousness toward us. He's talking about God's faithfulness. God is faithful to his promises God's faithfulness is revealed in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the Son of God who took our place, bore our sin, paid the price, gave his life away, we sang this morning. You gave your life away. God's love for us is not based on our faithfulness, but to God, on our faithfulness to God, but on God's faithfulness to us. Can I get a hallelujah on that? Praise the Lord. That's what hallelujah means, praise the Lord. God's faithfulness is not dependent upon our performance. How much Bible knowledge we have, how often we get our butts to church, our church attendance, anything else we do, good, bad, or ugly. God's mercy is not measured by the amount of faith we have, and that's something to be happy about because I don't know about you, Actually, I do know about you. I know about every one of you. You're just like me. Your faith wavers from day to day, from moment to moment, encounter to encounter. Our faith wavers. So let's wrap this up. What is the gospel? It is the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, life, death, and resurrection. You'll be able to remember that, right? And why is the gospel important? Why is the good news of Jesus important? Because it's how we find true happiness. And the power of sin and death is broken, and we become part of a new family. And God's faithfulness is revealed through his son. I read a fun definition of the gospel when I was preparing for this message. It said the gospel of God reveals how God is righteously righteousing unrighteous individuals. Say that with me. No, I'm just righteously, righteously righteousing. But that is kind of churchy, so we can make it less churchy by saying God is faithfully faithing unfaithful individuals. That sounds a little softer. It's why we gather together weekly to worship, to remember God's faithfulness, and to encourage one another in our own faith journey. In closing, I have one final thought. United Methodist bishop and author Will Willimon talks about God's faithfulness in his book called The Gospel for the Person Who Has Everything. That may sound a little familiar because we just did a sermon series not long ago on that book. But ironically, we changed the title of the series to be the good news for the person who has everything because we thought the gospel sounded a little too churchy. We changed it. Will Willman said this in his book, God refuses to be God without us. God refuses 
to be God without us. I had to think about that one for a minute. But then it brought to mind a line from the worship song, What a Beautiful Name. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. That's how committed and faithful God is. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, came down to rescue us. And that, my friends, is good news. In fact, very good, important news. And as my mom would say, the gospel truth. Amen? So be it.